Thank you for joining us tonight. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Gold text on a white background. Live from NYPL logo. Live from NYPL presents Transcendent Kingdom, Ya Jesse with Doreen San Felix. November 24th, 2020, 8 p.m. EST. This slide contains an image of the featured book jacket. It has a diagonal line dividing the cover crosswise, with the bottom half in black and the top in pink. Appearing above the line, the upper body of a dark-skinned figure is represented with their back to the viewer, their hands raised and their head bowed, as in prayer. The text reads, New York Times bestseller, Transcendent Kingdom, a novel. Ya Jesse, New York Times bestselling author of Homegoing. The slide text reads, Transcendent Kingdom is available for purchase online from the library shop, nypl.org slash shop. All proceeds benefit the New York Public Library. Plus, receive a free commemorative 125th anniversary tote bag with your purchase. This slide contains the same image of the featured book jacket with the Simply E logo. Reserve a copy of Transcendent Kingdom for free with a New York Public Library card. Available through Simply E on iOS and Android. This slide features the same image of the Transcendent Kingdom book jacket. In black text on a white background, this title and more are available in accessible formats for community members who do not use standard print. Find out more at nypl.org slash talking books. Black text on a white background. Recommended reading. Ya Jesse suggests these titles for further reading. Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments by Saidiya Hartman. Lost in the City by Edward P. Jones. Life on Mars by Tracy K. Smith. Check out these titles and more on Simply E. Accessible formats available through nypl.org slash talking books. Contact list checkout is available at more than 50 grab and go locations. nypl.org slash grab and go. Black text on a white background. Live from NYPL, upcoming events. Wednesday, December 2nd at 8 p.m. EST. Brian Washington with Vincent Cunningham part of the Harry Belafonte Black Liberation Speaker Series, with thanks to Kenneth Cole. The winner of the library's 2020 Young Lions Fiction Award discusses the tale of love, vulnerability, alienation, family, and separation at the heart of his first novel, Memorial. Tuesday, December 8th, at 8 p.m. EST. Robert B. Silver's Lecture, The Future of New York. At the close of one of the city's most challenging years, contributors to the New York Review of Books look toward a future of resilience and renewal for New York. Featuring Molly Crabapple, Deborah Eisenberg, Michael Greenberg, and Hari Kunzru. For more information and to register, visit nypl.org slash live. Black text on a white background. Live from NYPL, upcoming events. Wednesday, December 9th at 8 p.m. EST. To be a man, Nicole Krauss with Judith Thurman. Krauss discusses her first story collection, To Be a Man, and the everyday messiness of love, death, sex, power, and alienation that informs her characters' lives. Thursday, December 10th at 8 p.m. EST. Simply New York, Writing the City. Isaac Fitzgerald and an all-star team of writers pay homage to the city that has shaped their lives and work. Featuring Susan Choi, Marlon James, Min Jin Lee, and Isaac Fitzgerald. For more information and to register, visit nypl.org slash live. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Gold text on a white background. 
Live from NYPL Logo. Live from NYPL presents Transcendent Kingdom, Ya Jesse with Doreen San Felix. November 24th, 2020, 8 p.m. EST. This slide contains an image of the featured book jacket. It has a diagonal line dividing the cover crosswise, with the bottom half in black and the top in pink. Appearing above the line, the upper body of a dark-skinned figure is represented with their back to the viewer, their hands raised and their head bowed, as in prayer. The text reads, New York Times bestseller, Transcendent Kingdom, a novel. Ya Jesse, New York Times bestselling author of Homegoing. The slide text reads, Transcendent Kingdom is available for purchase online from the library shop, nypl.org slash shop. All proceeds benefit the New York Public Library. Plus, receive a free commemorative 125th anniversary tote bag with your purchase. This slide contains the same image of the featured book jacket with the Simply E logo. Reserve a copy of Transcendent Kingdom for free with a New York Public Library card. Available through Simply E on iOS and Android. This slide features the same image of the Transcendent Kingdom book jacket. In black text on a white background, this title and more are available in accessible formats for community members who do not use standard print. Find out more at nypl.org slash talking books. Black text on a white background. Recommended reading. Ya Jesse suggests these titles for further reading. Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments by Saidiya Hartman. Lost in the City by Edward P. Jones. Life on Mars by Tracy K. Smith. Check out these titles and more on Simply E. Accessible formats available through nypl.org slash talking books. Contactless checkout is available at more than 50 grab-and-go locations. nypl.org slash grab-and-go. Black text on a white background. Live from NYPL. Upcoming events. Wednesday, December 2nd at 8 p.m. EST. Brian Washington with Vincent Cunningham. Part of the Harry Belafonte Black Liberation Speaker Series with thanks to Kenneth Cole. The winner of the library's 2020 Young Lions Fiction Award discusses the tale of love, vulnerability, alienation, family, and separation at the heart of his first novel, Memorial. Tuesday, December 8th at 8 p.m. EST. Robert B. Silver's lecture, The Future of New York. At the close of one of the city's most challenging years, Contributors to the New York Review of Books look toward a future of resilience and renewal for New York. Featuring Molly Crabapple, Deborah Eisenberg, Michael Greenberg, and Hari Kunzru. For more information and to register, visit nypl.org slash live. Hello, my name is Aiden Flax Clark. Uh, I curate events for Live from NYPL and I feel very grateful that you've joined us tonight and that I get to introduce this conversation between Yah Jesse and Doreen St. Felice about Yah's latest novel, Transcendent Kingdom. You know, for a year that has been <laughs> so terrible in more ways than we have time to count, um, Transcendent Kingdom reminds me that one way in which 2020 has not been terrible is how much beautiful writing it's brought to us. I mean, it's kind of amazing that not a single year goes by pretty much no matter what, that um, we get so many great things to read in one year that getting through all of it would probably take a lifetime. But you know, if one year was gonna be the exception, it was gonna be 2020, right? But it wasn't, and there we were week after week getting so much incredible writing across a million genres, um, not least of which came from both of tonight's speakers, as anyone who's been reading Doreen's criticism this year or who's already read Transcendent Kingdom can attest. And I just have to say that for me, in a year bursting with incredible fiction, Transcendent Kingdom stands out as one of the best novels that I've read all year. Um, it's small, but it's deep. 
And I'm just, you know, in a week where we're thinking about gratitude, I'm just so grateful for Yah and Doreen being here to talk about it. Um, if you haven't purchased Transcendent Kingdom already, um, you can do that by going to the library shop um, at on.nypl.org slash shop live. Um, we'll also put that link in YouTube and Zoom. All proceeds go to benefit the New York Public Library and you get a free tote bag. Um, just a few quick housekeeping items and then we'll bring Yah and Doreen on. Um, first off, this event is being recorded, uh, not you, just what you're seeing on the screen. Um, also, Yah would love to answer some of your questions and she'll get to as many of them as she can at the end of the event, um, but you can start sending them now or at any time during the program uh, via Zoom, via YouTube, or you can email publicprograms at nypl.org. Real-time captions are available for tonight's program via stream text. If you need the link now, um, it should be in the chats on Zoom and in YouTube, like now. Um, lastly, we're going to close out the year with a bit of joy and, God forbid, a little bit of fun in our events. And we have a December packed full of great programs with Brian Washington, Nicole Kraus, Marlon James, Min Jin Lee, the New York Review of Books, Aparna Nancherla, Call Your Girlfriend, Jesus and Miro. We're going to do some good stuff next month, and we hope to see you there. So if you'd like to see everything that we have lined up and to sign up for some of the events, you can go to nypl.org live. Um, or you can get on the library's main newsletter so you don't actively have to remember things. We'll just tell you about them each week. And you do that by going to nypl.org slash connect. All right, let's bring on Doreen St. Felice and Yah Jesse. Hi. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Aiden. Yeah, again, I'm so happy to finally meet you. It's virtual, but I think we can try and um, contrive some intimacy here. Yes. Um, I am really, really looking forward to having a conversation about your second novel, Transcendent Kingdom. But before we begin, I know that you'd like to read us all a passage. Um, so please do. Yes, I would love to. Thank you so much, Doreen, for being in conversation with me tonight. Um, thank you to the New York Public Library for hosting this, and thanks to all of you for coming. I, I really appreciate you spending the evening with us. Um, I'm just going to read from the very beginning. Whenever I think of my mother, I picture a queen-sized bed with her lying in it, a practice stillness filling the room. For months on end, she colonized that bed like a virus, the first time when I was a child, and then again when I was a graduate student. The first time, I was sent to Ghana to wait her out. While there, I was walking through Kejitia Market with my aunt when she grabbed my arm and pointed. Look, a crazy person, she said in Chui. Do you see a crazy person? I was mortified. My aunt was speaking so loudly, and the man, tall with dust caked into his dreadlocks, was within earshot. I see, I see, I answered in a low hiss. The man continued past us, mumbling to himself as he waved his hands about in gestures that only he could understand. My aunt nodded, satisfied, and we kept walking past the hordes of people gathered in that agoraphobia-inducing market until we reached the stall where we would spend the rest of the morning attempting to sell knockoff handbags. In my three months there, we sold only four bags. Even now, I don't completely understand why my aunt singled the man out to me. Maybe she thought there were no crazy people in America that I had never seen one before. Or maybe she was thinking about my mother, about the real reason I was stuck in Ghana that summer, sweating in a stall with an aunt I hardly knew while my mother healed at home in Alabama. I was 11 and I could see that my mother wasn't sick, not in the ways that I was used to. I didn't understand what my mother needed healing from. I didn't understand, but I did. And my embarrassment at my aunt's loud gesture had as much to do with my understanding 
as it did with the man who had passed us by. My aunt was saying that that is what crazy looks like. But instead, what I heard was my mother's name. What I saw was my mother's face, still as lake water, the pastor's hand resting gently on her forehead, his prayer a light hum that made the room buzz. I'm not sure I know what crazy looks like, but even today, when I hear the word, I picture a split screen, the dreadlocked man in Kejitia on one side, my mother lying in bed on the other. I think about how no one at all reacted to that man in the market, not in fear or disgust, nothing, save my aunt who wanted me to look. He was, it seemed to me, at perfect peace, even as he gesticulated wildly, even as he mumbled. But my mother, in her bed, infinitely still, was wild inside. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. I'm really happy that um, you chose this beautiful first passage because as a reader and a follower of your work, it immediately jarred me when I opened this novel because mm -hmm introduced to you with your first novel, Homegoing, in which the vantage point is historical sweep. In many ways, you've given us an alternative in the, the Atlantic, right? Where we watch these branches of a family tree spread across the continents. But then with Transcendent Kingdom, the story is much more intimate, much more personal. In fact, we are looking through the world of the novel through the singular vantage point of our narrator, Gifty. And boy, is she an unreliable narrator. <laughs> I'd love to hear, obviously there's so much of your writing that we can't see, right? With novelists, you tend to see the iceberg on top of the surface, but there's much done underneath. But from what we've read by you, I would love to you know, hear about your experience as an author going from taking on an, ambition, an ambitious narrative in one sense, and then another one that is equally as ambitious, but is much more, um, I think, if it were a piece of architecture, it would be tinier, right? Like we would, mm -hmm. um, in many ways, we're not necessarily um, reading a global story. We're reading the specific story of this one person. And through inventing this character, you then have to invent the things that she chooses to know, the things that she doesn't know yeah. and all that. So I'd love to know about the shift in perspective, I guess you can say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was totally lost after homegoing. I didn't know what to do with myself. I think a thing that I hadn't really fully prepared for was this feeling of just kind of being bereft after spending years writing this book um, that, as you, as you said, was ambitious, that covered continents that had 14 POV characters. Um, I started Homegoing when I was uh, still in college, and so it had moved with me from college to graduate school, like it felt like my whole world. Um, and then I published it, and, um, and it received so much attention and had so much success and suddenly I just kept thinking like what do I do next like how do I how do I return to uh, the quiet that allows me to write what does that feeling look like um, and how do I get back to that place um, I had started writing a short story around the time that I finished a draft of Homegoing um, that was about a woman who was a Gerard Manley Hopkins scholar whose mother comes to stay with her. Um, and I really liked the voice of that story. It was so completely different from Homegoing in a number of ways. Um, but I, what I liked about it was the kind of intimacy, the, um, the, the laser focus on this one woman and her relationship with her mother. Um, I liked the scale of it, uh, but I didn't really know what, what to make of it. And it didn't feel at that point like, like a novel. Um, but then I started working on something that I thought was going to be a second novel. It was trash. 
I, I wrote maybe like 30, 40 pages of it. And I was just like, this isn't, this doesn't feel right. Um, and luckily for me, uh, my best friend at the time, well, my best friend still, but at the time she was finishing up her PhD in neuroscience. Um, and she had a pretty big paper that was set to be published um, that she was really excited about. I asked her to send it to me. Um, she did, and I sat down to read it and realized that I didn't understand a word of it. Um, which was a unique experience for me. So I just asked if I could go shadow her in her lab. Um, and it was really just walking with her in the lab, listening to her talk about her work, um, thinking about the implications that her work would have on humans um, at some point. Um, and suddenly the wheel started turning. I thought there, there might be a way to combine this, um, this idea with that situation of a woman who's incredibly intellectual, whose mother comes to stay. Um, so that was the genesis of, of this book for me. And I think one of the things that made it really feel possible um, to start writing again after a book like Homegoing was the fact that it was so completely different that I could kind of set all of the concerns of Homegoing aside um, and just ask myself new questions, uh, use new tools. Like I felt like I couldn't compare the books in my head even for myself in a way that was really freeing. Um, and, and the experience ended up being a really really beautiful one um, and and one that I'm really thankful for because now I do feel uh, more so now than after finishing Homegoing. Like I feel like I, I do have what it takes to uh, to finish a novel, <laughs> which I didn't know if I really did after Homegoing. I think you really get a sense of who the author is more so in the second novel than in the first. Mm -hmm. And what I found really fascinating immediately was um, the shift to the first person, right? Yeah. Because just to give the audience a sense of who Gifty is, she's a 28 year old scientist working at a lab in Stanford, studying depression and addiction in mice. And so she has this little situation that she sets up with the mice where they are um, trained to get little drips of Ensure, that nutritional shake that my mom used to feed me when I was a kid. <laughs> I was felt very seen by that detail, <laughs> um, but um, as the novel unfolds, it, the structure is actually very intricate because there is an epistolary element um, and there are flashbacks and there's also the present tense in the story that's being told from the vantage point of Gifty. And Gifty is surrounded by people who are very opaque, people who won't reveal themselves to her, her father, her brother and her mother, but Gifty herself is also inscrutable to mm -hmm. many people. And it's so different from having the omniscient, you know, I'm writing history feel right. that. So it's like, were you, it's hard to create a character like that because there are boundaries. There are certain things that Gifty is not gonna tell us. There's certain things that you know, we're not going to be able to be privy to because she is our entry point into the story. So I'd love to hear about, you know, just like the difficulty of writing through someone who is not transparent. Yeah. Um, so I had not written anything in the first person beyond like 20, 30 page short stories. Um, and I found it to be incredibly challenging, all the more so because as you said, Gifty is a character who is incredibly unreliable um, and who does kind of, she's not willing to be vulnerable even with herself and certainly not with an audience. Um, and so as the writer, I'm always trying to figure out ways to see around what she's saying. I spent a lot of time like thinking about first person narrators that I really like. Um, one uh, is John Ames in, in Marilyn Robinson's Gilead. Um, I think what works about that character is that he's so incredibly earnest um, that you can trust that he's telling you the truth. If he says something uncharitable, he comes back and kind of fixes the record, you know, and, and says, you know, I wasn't very nice about uh, about this guy yesterday, I'm gonna try to be nicer today. Um, and then another narrator I was thinking about was Humbert Humbert in Lolita, um, the exact opposite, right? Like completely um, 
and completely unreliable, lying to you the entire time. You know that he's despicable, um, but you're still like, you're still on the edge of your seat listening to everything that he says. Um, but the last narrator that I thought of and the one that I felt like worked most as a model for this book um, was from Ishiguro's uh, The Remains of the Day. And what I really like about that novel, which I think is just a beautiful novel um, in general, but what I love about the novel is that the narrator is incredibly unreliable, but his unreliability comes from the fact that he does not know himself um, because there are things that he won't look at, uh, things that he won't examine in his own life. Um, and so he's trying to tell you the truth. It's just that he doesn't see everything. Um, and that felt to me to be, um, uh, to be gifty situation like she's a character who because she has had such a chaotic childhood finds herself trying to kind of create control shape narrative around the circumstances of her life um, in such a way that she often doesn't allow herself um, to pay attention to her own emotional health um, and so you mentioned the uh, the epistolary nature of the book one thing that I found really helpful was the fact that bringing these journal entries in from her childhood suddenly we're able to see Gifty at her most vulnerable when she is being honest, um, honesty through these code names that she uses for her family, but honesty nonetheless, like she's finally kind of telling you bits and pieces about how she felt um, in ways that she doesn't uh, in her in her adulthood. Um, and so it, it was a matter of kind of trying to layer in different versions of Gifty so that you see her from many different vantage points. Um, but it's true, she's, an, she's a very reticent character. And she though you have characterized her as a scientist and as a career in life, I would say her posture is that of a writer, of an author. Through the fact that we have these, the letters in Transcendent Kingdom are actually letters that Gifty as a child wrote to God. It was her form of prayer. Um, mm -hmm. She's living in Huntsville, Alabama with initially both of her parents, but ends up just being her mother and older brother, Nana, who she idolizes. And she has difficulty connecting with God um, and her mother suggests that she writes to God and these are the letters. And I think the vulnerability is just like, it makes your skin prickle um, when juxtaposed with Gifty as a 28 year old, you know, around our age, who is trying to craft a stable narrative around something that she doesn't fully understand yet. So Gifty often in the book is saying, I studied depression and addiction. My mother was depressed. My mother is depressed. My, my brother, I think at this point, many people have read the novel, died um, heroin addiction. And in her mind, you can see her kind, kind of saying like, this is not the reason why I went into this field, but obviously it's related. But as a reader, you're kind of sitting there wanting to shake gifty, like mm -hmm. girl, you haven't actually processed um, in the way that you think that you have. And I'd love to hear how the themes coalesced because when you first start reading the book, it takes a minute to learn about Nana's addiction. Mm -hmm. And if you wrote it so beautifully at, for the first time I, in journalism or in fiction, I saw a black character suffering from drug addiction and being embraced by his interior world so much the people outside of it and it felt like a real intervention and it made the book feel contemporary in a way like it felt like it was speaking to um crises happening right now in america and that part of america so i'd love to hear you talk more about when that entered um the story Sure. Um, really from the very beginning. Um, at, so as I mentioned, the, the work that Gifty does is modeled after the work that my friend does, um, which is on reward seeking behavior. Um, she looks at psychiatric illnesses such as depression and addiction. Um, addiction being the one where uh, an animal, in her case mice, continue to seek reward even when they know there's great risk involved. Um, and then depression being um, an illness where 
wherein uh, an animal cannot seek reward, will not seek reward, um, even when there's great, great gain to be had from doing so. Um, and she'd always explained her work to me in those layman's terms as being about addiction and depression. You know, I didn't know any of the um, scientific stuff at all uh, in terms of in-depth scientific stuff. Um, and so from, from the start, I thought, what if, it almost felt like a writing prompt of a novel, like write a book about a woman who studies addiction and depression um, and has those, uh, has those two things impact her on a personal level. Um, and one of the reasons that I gravitated toward, um, toward writing about the opioid uh, crisis was because I was seeing so much incredible reporting around the opioid epidemic in the years that I uh, started writing this book, um, reporting that I felt like was finally kind of willing to uh, do things like interrogate the role of pharmaceutical companies in creating this problem, um, reporting that was interested in thinking about it from a healthcare perspective, uh, far less, you know, criminalizing uh, language. Um, and I recognized too that, you know, the reason we were seeing that kind of reporting was because this was um, a crisis, an epidemic that was largely affecting white people in rural and suburban areas. Um, and I felt like so much of these narratives that I was reading was leaving behind um, people who were suffering from a, a longer standing um, heroin crisis in, in cities, um, black people. Um, and so I wanted to uh, write a book that was willing to kind of take on that subject matter, but to do so with Black people at the center um, and to have the same kind of sensitive, nuanced, um, uh, careful, attentive uh, view of what the life of not just the person who's suffering from opioid use disorder, but the lives of everybody around them might look like. Um, and so it felt like, in some ways, like a, a way to kind of add um, add my voice to to that particular that particular narrative. I'd love to shift a little bit and talk about is somewhat taboo because we're talking about what exists outside of the novel. Um, but I think of you often as um, straddling very many different uh, viewpoints. You know, I think that there are Western audiences who read your fiction. There are also Ghanaian audi audiences who read your fiction. When I was in Ghana, I saw home going around. Um, and as someone who is a part of the diaspora as well, I'm often thinking if I write something and my aunts and my mothers can't connect to it or feel that I have like misrepresented the sort of like privacies and secrecies of your culture, that's like sort yeah. of but at the same time, there has to be a moment where you're you're not trying to necessarily represent in that sense, right? You have to put mm. yourself first. And Transcendent Kingdom is interesting because it's this family um, who has immigrated from Ghana to Huntsville, Alabama. And I don't think mm. you could have a bigger culture clash than that. Um, and I know that obviously that relates to your biography. And so I would... I guess it's more of a personal question, but like, how do you work through those issues that inevitably come up when you're writing for primarily Western audiences? But of course, that's not the only. Yeah. Well, I mean, you brought up some of the stuff that I talked to my therapist about, so I think it is like getting into all of the all of the nuance of like straddling these identities. But I often say, like, I wouldn't have written a book like Homegoing if I hadn't uh, if I hadn't come from Ghana, this country that had this role um, in the slave trade, and then. Uh, ended up growing up in Alabama, uh, a place where that history is worn on, on its sleeve quite, um, quite keenly. And it, it felt to me, even as a child, like I was existing in these liminal spaces between, um, between these two countries. And I didn't know how to reconcile them in large part because we were living in such an isolated situation. Um, we weren't just living in Alabama away from um, Ghanaian community. We were also living on the predominantly white side of Alabama away from black community. Um, and so I'd always felt like um, a drift in some way. And it was it wasn't until I got to college that I started to kind of um, try to kind of connect some of these dots for myself, try to um, 
figure out how to create community. Um, and in so doing, I think writing became really for me like a way to, um, to allow myself space to exist, to allow uh, stories about uh, people who had gone through some of the sim similar things that I had gone through um, to come to the fore. Um, I really am a firm believer, and I'm gonna butcher the quote, but I think Morrison said something like, if you're looking um, on your bookshelf for a book that you want to read and you can't find it, you must write it. Um, that that I think is is what I'm always thinking about when I sit down to write. Like, what would 15 year old Ya have liked to have seen in the world um, when when she was at the library browsing all these books, looking for somebody to kind of tell her that she fits somewhere. Um, and that's what that's what these books I think offer is this opportunity to. Um, to say there, there is a place for these kinds of stories. Um, it might not look exactly the way that somebody who had grown up in Ghana their entire life um, would write this book, um, but, it's, but it's how I see it. Right. Um, speaking of racism, city <laughs> <laughs> and vitality to the way that we understand each of the individual's characters experiences with racism. And it really stopped me in my tracks. In my tracks because, you know, I think we're in this moment of like hyper awareness of there being an automatic assumption that all people and black people especially have a visceral understanding of what racism is and when it's happening to them. Mm -hmm. What's so great about transcendent is that all the characters are in varying degrees of denial, right? We have, um, who was so humiliated by how he's treated in America that he goes back home. We have the mother who, when she's working as a caretaker, tends to a man who calls her the N-word, um, but she never really names that as racist. Mm -hmm. Nana, who is um, gifted with her brother, is revered in a way that's like fetishizing, right? When he is just down, but then when he tumbles down his addiction, is kind of cast away and Gifty herself is at 28 years old still tentatively understanding um, but she's not she's not like aggressive in naming the experiences that have happened to yeah. her both as a child and also as an older woman and I like just want to I guess celebrate the fact that you were willing to um be more precise and not so like moralistic about the depiction. Cause I think it's true that often these black characters don't necessarily feel that these experiences are injustices. There's mm. like nuance to the way um, each of the characters uh, broaches that in, in the mm. book. It's not the main theme. It's something that's more secondary but it was something that really struck me while I was reading. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's a there's a point that I was kind of using to think about Gifty's relationship um, to racism uh, that comes in the novel after uh, Nana's has, his addiction has has begun and she's at her church and she attends a predominantly white church um, in Alabama and she overhears these two women speaking about Nana um, in in really racist terms so. Gifty doesn't call it that, um, but they say something like uh, his kind has a taste for drugs and she overhears this and what she calls it is a spiritual wound. Um, and she talks about how it takes her years to kind of understand and unpack that moment. Um, and I think uh, that Gifty is a character who it is going through a lot of internalized racism that she doesn't have the tools to unpack. Um, but it's something I think that she, as we as we see her throughout the novel, she like starts to do that work. Like she's trying to figure out um, what these moments in her childhood have have meant to her, how they've shaped her adulthood, how they've shaped her relationship to her brother and her and her mother and her father. Um, she's kind of gaining the language um, for those experiences as we as we read, as we watch her. Gifty has difficulty communicating. She has difficulty with language. There are not very many marks in this novel. Um, often, a paragraph will have many sentences about her interior monologue, but what she actually tells the character who she's interacting with is the tersus, you know, line giving away that about her family life. Um, and I guess my question is, 
what is it like writing a book about the failure of language, the failure of communication? Mm. How do you express that using the medium that isn't reachable for not only gift, but for mother who basically stopped speaking in the third yeah. Donna, who is no longer there to tell his story? Yeah. Uh, yeah, for me, this book was so much about these absences that feel like presences. Um, thinking about, you know, the kind of real physical loss of Nana, obviously, who passed away, um, but also of uh, Gifty's father who moves back to Ghana. And she refers to him as this kind of disembodied voice on the telephone. Like that's how she, that's how she knows him. And when she talks to him, she has these really terse conversations. Um, but then there's also this real loss of, of communication between her and her mother, who is incredibly emotionally distant for reasons that we never quite get to know, you know. Um, I think of Gifty's mother as a woman who has um, who has her secrets. Um, we don't fully understand um, why she why she wanted to go to America, um, why she stuck it out even after her husband left. Um, I think there's so much that Gifty doesn't know um, that that would probably be helpful for Gifty to know. Um, but at any rate, Gifty is a is a woman who is raised within these these silences, um, and and she does have a hard time. I think speaking about her experience narrating her experience. That's why writing becomes so important to her. That's why these journal entries become so important to her. Um, but I think the challenge for me, again, was like trying to find ways to, um, to bring in what she wasn't saying, whether it was through these journal entries, whether it was um, through kind of scientific experiments, whether it was through um, scientific writing that she was interested in, um, ways to say, you know, if Gifty says something like, I chose this career because it was the hardest thing you can do, um, ways to show that that's not actually why she chose this career. Um, but it, it, it was a matter of kind of navigating, navigating her silences and navigating the silences she had in inherited um, because of the way that her family was. And I think the way, you know, the story accretes and builds on top of itself, you sort of have these light bulb moments where um, the story of Nana developing his addiction is that he uh, hurts his ankle during a basketball game and the doctor kind of like haphazardly gives him a prescription for Oxy. And Gifty tells us this sort of plainly while at the same time talking about working in her lab and there she becomes attached to this one mouse. And this mouse is the one that is like fully addicted to the nutritional shake and the mouse develops a limp. And Gifty is telling us this and never does she make the connection. And yeah. I think as a reader, you're really activated and engaged because you're like, oh, this is part of the meta narrative, right? Yeah. This yeah. narrative, see what's happening before mm -hmm. her and how drawing connections um, without without knowing it. Um, and that was something I really appreciated. Um, I think a question that I have, this is like a juicier question <laughs> about her sexuality, because there are two moments um, in the novel where you're like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> but it's so fascinating because she doesn't really remark upon them. She remarks on so much else regarding her repression, but not that. And so mm. I like would love to talk about what you think Gifty is like with regards to that. Yeah, absolutely. I spent a lot of time thinking about how to represent Gifty's sexuality in this book. Um, and for me, it kind of, it kind of landed on the fact that she grew up in this church that is incredibly repressive to say the least about any kind of sexuality. Um, she talks about the fact that she uh, was told, you know, that, um, that, that her vagina was like a silver box and all of these like metaphorical language uh, to the point where she didn't, she couldn't even put a tampon in because she didn't really understand her anatomy at all. Um, and, and when she's asking her mother to further explain this, she's also met with, with silence. And so I think Gifty grows up with a lot of shame and again, a lot of silence around, um, around sexuality, around sex, around, um, around like desire. Um, and, and 
she's already a character who isn't always willing or able to articulate her desires in any other way. And so when she encounters these moments where she is desiring someone um, who's also a woman, she, she just like shuts down, like she can't engage. Um, and I think that it's consistent with the other ways that she can't engage, but it's different too. Um, in this particular case, like there isn't much uh, that the book offers you in terms of ways to see around what she's saying, other than those kind of glances uh, at the Safeway cashier, um, those moments where she just kind of very quickly says that she and Anne did something, um, but she won't tell you what. Um, and so you're meant to kind of like piece it together beyond what she's saying. But for me, I think it had to do with the fact that there's so much shame around um, around her sexuality in general. And she was raised to be really kind of um, walled off, um, uh, raised to kind of think about her, her sexuality, her virginity as a kind of fortress. Um, and so to have broken that fortress in any, in any way, to have let anyone into that fortress in any way, I think um, is more than she can bear and more than she's like willing to talk about even, even though we're meeting her in adulthood. And so with the character Gipke's mother, I think is in some ways, uh, she and Nana are like the largest absent presence in the book. And with her, it's even more intense because like her absence is really physical. Yeah. Like, Gipke is constantly staring at the slope of her large back. Um, and it made me think a lot about um, contemporary thing that we've been seeing in novels, which is the idea of reluctant motherhood. These women, mm -hmm have, I guess you could say late 20th century women whose identities are supposed to be as mothers, but through whatever, you know, device the author has chosen to create are manifesting um, their maybe even desire to have not been that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's this amazing um, scene or interaction, I think it is, between Gifty and her mother, where her mother doesn't want Gifty Gifty doesn't want her. They both just want yeah. Nana. Yeah. And I thought that was a really fascinating kind of like flip of like the Bechdel idea in a, no in a novel because I think that's real, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And so what was it like writing a mother who doesn't want to or now cannot mother her child? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is so much inertia with Gifty's mother's character um, because of the fact that she's quite literally in bed for much of the book, um, but also because of her own like secretiveness, also because of the fact that she, um, even in Gifty's younger years, spends so much time outside of the home caring for other people um, and doesn't and isn't available to Gifty and Nana in the ways um, that they might want or need. But what we do know is that she does like dearly want Nana, um, that she prayed for him, um, spent days praying for him after it seemed that she couldn't have children, um, and to have him and to have him be a boy in this incredibly patriarchal culture um, meant everything to her. And she was willing kind of to, um, to do anything just to have this child. And she felt like she had kind of paid her dues. And so when Gifty comes along, uh, Gifty grows up really kind of understanding that she wasn't prayed for, wasn't kind of desired, that she does kind of exist in the shadow of this beloved child, um, this kind of, I think she calls him the true gift, um, and, and that her mother's relationship to relationship to her is always going to be um, one that uh, that needs the context of Nana in order to kind of be able to feel the, the maternal love um, that that uh, that her mother is capable of. Um, one way that I wanted to kind of show Gifty and her mother's relationship um, in, in, on their own terms was through this vehicle of, uh, of religion. Um, religion, I think, became the only language that these two women had um, for speaking to one another. And it felt, for me, as a way of showing that if Gifty had completely abandoned the Pentecostalism of her childhood, um, 
she would have also had to have abandoned her mother. And so she allows space for that, that uh, faith to still exist in her life in great part because that's one of the ways that, she still, that she's still able to communicate with her mother. Um, and then the other way that I think these two women um, show their love, um, show that they want each other is through these, these really subtle and gentle acts of care. Um, and Gifty's mother is a caretaker by profession. So that's natural, you know, we see her um, it, when Nana is in the depths of his addiction, we see her bathing him, um, praying over him. Um, but in her her own depression, we see Gifty performing these same kinds of tasks, uh, bringing her food, um, rubbing her arm, uh, bringing her a Bible because she knows she might want it. Um, and so, even though these two women, again, like don't um, they don't they are they are very walled off. They are very reticent, um, and they don't seem to want each other. Um, they do they do show each other how they care um, and why they need each other through uh, through the religion and, and through these acts of care. Right. And there's that um, scene that's very quick, in which Gifty's mother is getting ready for work and she's primping in the mirror, admiring herself. And Gifty's also looking in the mirror and has asked, asked her mother if she's beautiful. And the response, I thought it was so well drawn because it's it's actually very oblique, but in some ways it's the most precise way for a mother like her to address her child. Mm. Because look what God made, like look what I made. Mm. And that's so much more powerful than saying that she's beautiful. Mm. Um, and I thought that the those like, little tiny bursts of like deep affection between them even as they are just like existentially separated from each other it just felt like really real like it was drawn from an observed relationship or something like that so mm -hmm. that's something that I enjoy um we have just a couple of minutes before we get to the Q&A can't even believe it <laughs> um but I think I had meant to ask a little bit more and I think we can end on this note. I wanted to ask you about the timeline and linearity. Um, it's only after you finish a novel that you appreciate like how many jumps in time there are yeah. and how easy it is as a reader to keep up. I never really felt unmoored. Um, and yeah, as with Homegoing, I'm, I'm interested in what did you feel about the structure that you felt maybe like mirrored the nature of the topics or the themes of the novel being depression and addiction. It seemed like they're in conversation. Mm. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, structure was the hardest part for me, uh, in great part because I'm not a big planner. Um, so I'm not one of those people that has like the note cards out everywhere, like knowing exactly where I'm going to be in time at any given moment. Um, so there was that piece, but there was also the fact that I had come off of Homegoing, which had an incredibly tight structure, even given the, the sprawl of the book, there was um, almost kind of a mathematical sense to it. Like I knew I wanted to start in 18th century Gold Coast and end in present day America. So I had only so many chapters um, that I could use to get there. Um, and so the, the structure was really kind of um, neat and intuitive in a way that I knew that Transcendent Kingdom was not going to be. Um, and because the front story of Transcendent Kingdom was so still, again, not much is happening. She's Gifty is going to the lab and then she's coming home to a mother who's in bed. Um, but uh, those moments in the lab and those moments with her mother are driving her to, to reminisce on her childhood. Um, what ended up happening is that I, I wrote this sentence toward the beginning of the book um, where Gifty says something like, there used to be four of us, then three, then two. If my mother goes, whether by choice or not, there will only be one. Um, and after I wrote that sentence and thought about it for a little bit, I thought, oh, this is the structure of the book. Um, and so I wanted there to be this kind of cascading um, flashback feel where, where you begin with the fullness of this family. Um, you're seeing Gifty and her parents and her brother, um, and then slowly it kind of diminishes until at the end you're left with just Gifty. Um, and it felt like a good way to kind of tie in her memories to, uh, to the work that she's doing in her lab. Um, Nana is always going to kind of be 
referenced uh, or is always going to be brought back into her life through uh, the mouse with the limp that you mentioned earlier. Um, so there are these little moments that I could kind of uh, tie together, um, but the overall feel was was one of like a, a spiral that that ends with Gifty. From four to three to two to one, right? Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for talking with me. At this point, we're to the questions. Um, and so I have a first one for you. Gifty is a wonderfully complicated and flawed character. There are times when her behavior or her choices are working against her best interest, whether she knows it or not. Can you tell us a bit about how you process your own impulses as a writer to spare your protagonist pain and how you felt when you chose the tougher rather than the easier paths for Gifty? Mm. Um, you know, I, I am one of those writers, like I recognize that I'm doing things to my characters, like I don't feel like the characters are, um, are like appearing fully formed. I don't, I'm not one of the writers who feels like I can hear my characters talking to me or like telling me what to do. I am aware of the fact that I'm, that I'm creating it. Um, but at the same time, like it doesn't, ever feel like I have a choice. Like it, I don't ever feel like I could just give Gifty an easier situation. It just feels like this is what happens because this is what happens. Um, and so it's not necessarily um, a matter of wanting to kind of hide Gifty's flaws, um, but rather recognizing that she is flawed, that she's bringing all of her identities to bear on everything that she does in life. Um, and that she can't kind of, um, she can't and I can't um, kind of pick and choose um, which elements, um, which elements are like more favorable um, to, to show um, or to experience. Um, and so that was a, not a great answer to a good question, which is just to say, I'm, I'm not sure. It just feels, um, to me, it feels inevitable um, as I'm writing. I have another question for you. Mm -hmm. How did you about the proportion of time spent on information, for example, the passages on science and religion versus the internal experience of Gifty and the plot unfolding both in her present and past and ensuring that those more informational components were added rather than distracting. Mm. Yeah, um, well, as a lay person, I knew that, you know, there's only so much like nitty gritty science that, uh, that people can, <laughs> can read, um, just speaking from myself and my attempt to read that one paper um, and sell, like I recognize that um, if there was too much kind of scientific data, um, it would pull people out of the story and that there was a way because of how, um, how well the, the science of this novel maps on to human experience um, to choose to kind of pitch the research toward, toward narrative whenever possible. Um, and so that's kind of how I kept the balance. Like I wanted it to, um, I wanted it to be kind of accurate enough and feel, um, feel kind of, you know, uh, uh, professional enough that a neuroscientist could pick it up and read it and feel as though they were understanding um, what Gifty's research um, looked like. Um, but at the same time, I wanted lay people to, to get a sense of it as well. Um, and that was really just a matter of, of reading it a lot um, and sharing it with, with other people um, who hadn't been spending years researching optogenetics um, and so were like these blank slates for me. Um, interestingly, when I shared it with um, my, my friend, the neuroscientist, she was the only one of my readers who was like, is there too much science in this? Um, everybody else was like, oh, this, the proportion is good. So um, make of that what you will. That's so amazing. Yeah, I, don't, I was reading Sometimes those passages, I forgot that I was reading a novel. I just was like, oh, I'm now learning how to do <laughs> <laughs> Right. We all have our PhD in neuroscience now. Yeah, the quick, the quick uh, fashion. Yeah. So we have a question, um, and this uh, person loves the passage that you read. I was following the references to the dreadlocked man throughout the novel and notice that Gifty grows dreadlocks at one point. Is there any symbolism you see in her growing the dreadlocks and her relationship to the image of the dreadlocked man? Mm. Well, I think that the dreadlocks for Gifty um, that she grows um, is a kind of rejection of, um, of 
just this idea that her mother had of like neatness, um, of cleanliness. She talks about when she goes home with the beginnings of dreads, her, mo her mom stops talking to her um, and says that people will think less of you. People will think that you grew up in a, in a bad home, in a dirty home. Um, and for a woman who has spent so much of her childhood, um, so much of, of, her, of her life really um, trying to be good um, and thinking about like goodness in the terms of the church, thinking about goodness in the eyes of her mother um, that felt like the first time that she's kind of allowing herself to um to yeah just to not have that that imposed upon her and she probably got the idea from the man that she saw but I don't know if she could articulate that and I don't know if I if I meant that intentionally um but I do think that it was uh one of the few instances of the novel where you get to see Gifty kind of outright rejecting um these these strictures of goodness that have been placed um both culturally and and through her religion I also think about I know a lot of women, friends of mine in their 20s who kind of like just start growing locks in a way that they fall into. It's like you get them mm. and then you're like, I'm doing this now. And yeah. I think because it is a process that like by definition takes years, it's something that you might do tentatively and then it's only 15 years on that you feel like you actually have an identity or a relationship to right. the character. Right. Um, so this is another question. I love this talk and all that you've shared. Could you speak to the character of Han and why you chose to include him, write him the way you did and end the book the way you did? That's a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so I, I loved Han and really in the beginning, like when I was writing the first draft, I wasn't really thinking about um, his significance um, as a character. Just, I knew that she needed to have a lab mate um, and I didn't know what to do with him. Um, but as I wrote that first draft, what I started to realize was that given the fact that there are so few places in Gifty's life where she can be honest and open or where she feels like she can be honest and open. And given the fact that anytime anyone tries to kind of approach the subject of her brother with her, um, she closes off. There was something really nice about Han being this character with whom she could speak about her brother, felt like she could speak about her brother because she was doing so through the lens of her work. Um, so when she starts to kind of open up to him and mention um, aspects of her childhood that she really closes off um, to other people, she does so, I think, in a way that that is kind of scientifically minded. She thinks Han can understand this on this one level. Um, and I think that's what al allows her to, to slowly but surely um, finally uh, give, give somebody a piece of herself that she does not give um, anyone else in the rest of this novel. So Han felt like a um, kind of a soft landing for Gifty um, and, and I appreciated that. As for the ending, um, earlier, an earlier draft of this novel ended super abruptly um, without the kind of coda that, uh, that comes at the end. It just ended with her in the car after that drive to San Francisco, um, wondering what was going to become of her mother. Um, and I liked that ending, um, but after I shared it with some of my readers, they were like, okay, this is too, this is too abrupt. Like I need to know what happened um, to the mother. Um, and and so the the next ending that I wrote was this this one that felt kind of like a again like a coda like it didn't feel like uh, like it was completely closing the circle. Um, it still felt like Gifty was you know kind of continuing to have all of the questions that she had um, in other parts of this book, but that she had finally come to a place where um, she didn't feel so burdened by them. So I think of the ending really as that like the last pose in yoga where you're just kind of like lying on the mat. Like that's what that's what it felt like to me to write that ending. Like Gifty's just on the mat. Yeah. And I I personally love stories in which ambitious women kind of end up with male partners that are maybe not the loves of their life, but just like someone that they can live with. And I think yeah. this relationship with Raymond who never considers that he wants Gifty to communicate in his way of communicating. Mm. And he understand that she's not comfortable kind of yeah. with and like speaking at length because he's a humanities guy and like yeah. never 
see what Han sees, which is you can be having a conversation about something by doing a scientific experiment. And that is right. like, um, commensurate in terms of like the revealing of yourself that happens in, um, in their talks. So I loved that contrast of relationship. Mm. Yeah. Uh, this is a fun question. I'm dying to know, what is your zodiac sign? Sun, <laughs> whatever you care to share. <laughs> <laughs> that is a fun question. I'm a cancer. I'm my birthday is June 29th, so I'm like um, on the cusp. Okay. <laughs> All right. What? The cusp of Gemini and Cancer. Yeah. I'm not a big astrology person, but <laughs> I don't know what that tells. I'm not a big astrology person either, but I think um, most of the people who are astrology people in my life, when they find out my sign are like, oh yeah. <laughs> so whatever that means to you. <laughs> I'm an Aries. I think that's supposed to be bad. <laughs> <laughs> All I know about cancers is that we cry a lot, which is true for me. So there you go. <laughs> um, so this is a question asking, what advice do you have for those who struggle to write or express their stories and feelings within themselves? Mm. My biggest advice, um, which feels really simple and easy, um, but is still to my mind, the best way that you can uh, approach your, your writing is just to read as much as possible um, and read as widely as possible, read across genre, um, read things that feel harder than what, you, um, what you're able to do at this point uh, in your writing life um, and, and kind of continue to ask questions about what the writer is doing and how they're doing it as you read. Um, that's been, I think, the best teacher that I have ever had um, is, is the books themselves, the work itself. Um, so uh, keep that alive in you. And then the other thing that I would say is um, to not be so, so strict with yourself. I feel like I went to grad school and my first teacher at Iowa um, told us that we had to write for three hours a day every day. And she was like, you write on the days that you eat. Um, and I was like, okay, I will do this. Um, and it never really worked for me. And I realized that that kind of like um, all the pressure that I was putting on myself to like write something, um, write anything uh, wasn't helpful. So if you find that that advice that you're being given does not work for you. Remember that you can discard it and there's always somebody who does it a different way um, and that that and that way works. So find find your find the shoe that fits for you. So there are no rules. Yeah. <laughs> I want to thank you so much for talking with me this evening about Transcendent Kingdom. I was telling y'all before I went online, I've been having a really tough time reading at all, concentrating during this year of isolation. And ironically, it was this book about emotional isolation that opened the dance uh, for me. And so I'm personally mm -hmm. very involved, um, but also I'm just so happy to see you flourish and I'm looking forward to the next novel. Mm -hmm collection I don't know but I will be waiting <laughs> oh thank you Doreen I really appreciate it I'm such a fan of your work this was this was lovely thank you black text on white background New York Public Library lion logo 125 years Learn more about the New York Public Library, nypl.org.